Is Aung San Suu Kyi complicit in war crimes or even genocide against the Rohingya Muslims of Myanmar? On up front, I'll ask one of her closest allies. I'm Mehdi Hassan. Also on the show, there was a lot of optimism when Emmanuel Macron came to power in France in 2017. But halfway through his term, the French president is facing some of the worst protests and strikes in his country's history. So how much is he to blame, especially for excessive use of force by the French police? That's our debate. But first, in January, the International Court of Justice ordered Myanmar to, quote, take all measures within its power to prevent genocidal acts against the Rohingya Muslim minority. But Myanmar's de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi says the abuses have been exaggerated. So is she guilty of covering up not just war crimes, but genocide? I'll ask her ally and former spokesperson, this week's headliner, Burmese activist Nyo On Min. Nyo on Mint, thank you for joining me on Upfront. Um, given the horrific violence against the Rohingya in Myanmar, in recent years, your former boss, Aung San Suu Kyi, as you know, has been roundly condemned by the international community, by her fellow Nobel Peace laureates. She's been stripped of her honorary Canadian citizenship, of her Amnesty International Ambassador of Conscience Award, of her US Holocaust Museum Award. And in January, rather humiliatingly, the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, rejected her defense of Myanmar's actions and insisted that she act to protect the Rohingya Muslims from genocide. Was that the last nail in the coffin of her once hallowed reputation? Uh, I think because, you know, all the, most of the international People live in the rumors, hearsay, and then second, you know, the version of the the one-sided accusations. So that's why the, that's the problem of the uh, the in that our Western country side situation. The, the very firstly, there was two communities from a kind, and what you call the Rohingya, we call the Bengalis. So th that's a conflict been a la very long, you know, period of time. So I think uh, Don San Suu Kyi, uh, no, I'm not, you know, like protecting her, but uh, fair to say that she got to to defend the, the country and then to clear the, the Myanmar's name at the court. I don't think uh, that ver this is not a final verdict, but this is the only of uh, the, the ruling of the uh, Professional measure at the ICJ. Neil no, Min, just to be clear, uh, you dismissed what I described as uh, the criticisms of Western countries. Uh, a lot of those Nobel Peace laureates are not Westerners. Uh, they're actually from the Global oh. South. And your own neighbors in Bangladesh have also been pretty scathing uh, in their criticisms of your government. By the way, you said that, you know, we call them the Rohingya and you call them Bengali. They call themselves Rohingya. Why won't you call them what they call themselves? So it's at the uh, it's they brought from the the British you know colonial period. We never heard about the Rohingya, but you know I don't mind that to call them a Rohingya or Bengali. Okay. This is not the case. Okay. Well, aside from naming aside, you have seven hundred thousand. Uh, Rohingya displaced from their homes, uh, 10,000 people possibly dead, thousands of Rohingya women and girls raped, sexually assaulted, around 300 Rohingya villages burned to the ground. For the past few years, Aung San Suu Kyi and the Myanmar government denied any of this had happened. Uh, they suggested it was all fake news. Uh, and yet at the ICJ in December, Suu Kyi conceded for the first time that, yes, human rights abuses and war crimes may have been committed by the Tat Madar, by the Myanmar military. What changed? What happened was very last in 2017, August, when the, the Rohingya militant group, we call that the terrorist group, killed the, uh, the and attacked the uh, 30 police stations and one military base. So then, you know, people got the only hearsay and then, you know, only a one side accusation. This is a very good that the ICJ. A ruling is that we have a chance to clear that the that accusation. But, but hold on. That, 
Hold on. You say yeah. you say that the terrorist group committed atrocities and it's all one-sided. That's not true. Amnesty, Human Rights Watch have all criticised uh, militant groups for their atrocities. The UN has said uh, that there were atrocities. But what the UN fact-finders in 2018 said is that nothing these groups did warranted the response that came from the Burmese military. Killing indiscriminately, gang-raping women, assaulting children, burning entire villages. The UN says none of this is justified by what any militant group may or may not have done. Are you saying it is justified to do this as part of some sort of war on yeah, terror? We have, a, we have a evidence that the Hindu 103 the Hindu group has been killed. It's a murder. I, I'm, I'm not disputing that. I'm saying, does that justify the Burmese military quote from the UN killing indiscriminately, gang raping women, assaulting children, and burning entire villages? That's not a proportionate response. In fact, the UN fact finders accused the Burmese military of genocide, as have experts at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, the International State Crime Initiative in London, and the unanimous vote in the Canadian Parliament in Ottawa. These are accusations of genocide here, Nyon Mint. I think. I think that this is the political accusation. Use Why is the U... What, 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 sorry, sorry, what political law. agenda is the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum pushing? What agenda do they have? Because, you know, because, you know they, they, they just joined the bandwagon. What's the genocide bandwagon? Which, ba which bandwagon is that? I mean, like, the, the whole international media, media pointed out that, media accused that, and then uh, that's the uh, only... It's Sorry, sorry, it's not the media. UN fact finders interviewed Rohingya women who have been raped and assaulted, and you're smiling and rolling your eyes. I don't understand. Is it not serious enough for you? Okay, it's at the if, if one case, or you said that the, the thousands of women have been raped, they, they got a DNA test. And they, when they were born, they got a, like I know, the Burmese half, Burmese half you know, the Rohingyas. One, you have that evidence? One Rohingya woman says, eyewitness says, that when she tried to hold on to her 18-month-old baby, the child was lifted from her. They threw my baby into a fire. They just flung him in the fire. These are the kind of atrocities that are happening in Rakhine State that have been happening for years. You, that have been... Just only a witness and that they're the only accusation. What does that mean, it's only an accusation? Yeah. It's a woman who lost her baby. Is she lying? I'm not really sure. God, God, uh, no. So when a, when, a, when, a, when a woman tells Amnesty International, uh, two soldiers came and tied my hands and legs together with rope. They dragged me to one side. Four of them took me and all four raped me. She's just lying to Amnesty International. I don't know, because if I, if I look at her eye, maybe it, she was true or maybe she was not, she was lying. Because, you know, uh, because someone said that, okay, because United But this Nations... is not one woman, Neon Mint. Hundreds of Rohingya women and girls were raped. 80% of the rapes have been corroborated by UN fact-finders as gang rapes. The Burmese military are being held responsible for 82% of these gang rapes. And you're sitting here saying, I don't know, I have to look them in the eye. You, you're, you were an activist for democracy, yeah. Neon Mint. If somebody had said to you no, in the no, 80s, no, no, no. you're just it, making it up, it, how would you have felt? You feel that when you... When I read that the US... The State Department report say that the, uh, the, the Rohingya women was raped by the soldiers and surrounded by the hundreds of the soldiers. It was looked like a, the very, you know, the, the third class Hollywood movie, more than that. It's a Hollywood movie. The UN fact-finding report and Amnesty International Human Rights Watch, it's a Hollywood movie. So, because they want... What I don't get is every time I mention women being sexually assaulted, you smile. Forgive me, why are you doing that? Come on. You know, I'm just like, I know, because I disagree with you. I mean, you're dismissing pretty serious allegations. You can disagree with me while taking seriously the fact that many women... I mean, here's a question for you. Why not allow in yeah, people into Rakhine State? Be, Why not allow people something. into Rakhine State to see for themselves? Why, if you've done nothing wrong, if your government has done nothing wrong, why have they banned the UN Special Rapporteur from entering the country, banned the UNHCR from entering Rakhine State, banned international media from going and seeing for themselves? Sounds like you have a lot to hide for a government that's done nothing wrong. Yeah, you, you might be true. That there is, uh, because, you know, the government handling this case, it's uh, very loosely, and then 
you know, they have no, oh, what, what I should say that the consequences, they, don't, they didn't care about the consequences. If I were the government in that position, I would bring that the other international media, the like a US facts finding, <clears throat> independence facts finding, to find it out. Let's talk about Aung San Suu Kyi, your former boss. Many would argue that, like a lot of people in Myanmar, she seems to have a problem with Islam and with Muslims. Uh, she once reportedly complained about being interviewed by a Muslim. In 2015, she purged her party, your party, of all Muslim parliamentary candidates. Uh, she's dismissed allegations of ethnic cleansing in Rakhine as Muslims killing Muslims. She even held a meeting with Hungarian far-right Prime Minister Viktor Orban, where they agreed, quote, that continuously growing Muslim populations posed a grave challenge. Is this bigoted, divisive, Islamophobic language really the appropriate language for a Nobel Peace Laureate to use? I think uh, maybe she got in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I don't think that uh, she was she was at the anti-Muslim because the our Burmese Muslim. Uh, and then, you know, agree with that. She doesn't have it, any intention to against or discriminate against the other religion. But our Burmese people, majority Buddhists, thought that she is against the uh, Buddhists also. I think uh, she's a problem. But when she goes and sees Viktor Orban and says there's a problem of, quote, continuously growing Muslim populations, that sounds pretty genocidal to me. Ah, uh, well, that's the, I don't, I, you know, the action is worth. I think words are louder than action, or action is louder than words. Well, words lead to actions. Many people would say that violence is incited by leaders. If you hear, I mean, you're rolling your eyes, Not but as, if, if you're a Muslim Rohingya refugee and you hear that your leader of your country is referring to you as a continuously growing population, by the way, it's only 4% of the Myanmar population is Muslim, uh, but it's a continuously growing Muslim population that poses a challenge, she says, standing next to a far-right nationalist leader like Viktor Orban. Aung San Suu Kyi was once a hero to liberals across the world. Now she's allied with far-right bigots like like Viktor Orban. Once you're the head of the state or the de facto leader, whatever, whenever you go, so you have to, your enemy or your friend, you have to shake hands. That's at the You country. can shake their hands. You don't have to make Islamophobic statements with them, do you? Do you think, never, do you think the Muslims in Myanmar so are... Hold I, on, I, I I'll cannot, ask you a question. OK, I'll ask you the question then, if you don't want to speak for her. Do you think Muslims in Myanmar are a problem and a challenge and a continuously growing challenge, as she said in Hungary, in a statement with the Hungarian government? Uh, I don't think we have a Muslim people. I really, because my close friends are Muslims, I'm really concerned that... I mean, the fact that your close friends are Muslims doesn't mean that your country doesn't have a Muslim problem. Uh, one last question. Do you think Aung San Suu Kyi's once legendary reputation and Myanmar's global reputation can ever recover from any of this? I think uh, after, you know, ICJ, you know, court, you know, uh, fighting, I think uh, we should clear the name and then we have to, uh, to look at the how we live together with the Muslim or Christian or Buddhist and that's a more important, more, you know, the cohesion and the more, you know, uh, they, they live together. Neil on Mint, thank you for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. In 2017, Emmanuel Macron swept French traditional political parties aside as he led a new movement known as En Marche, or On the Move, all the way to the presidency. But just over halfway through Macron's presidential term, France doesn't seem to be on the move at all. Instead, it's been paralysed by mass protests and workers' strikes opposed to the president's plan to reform the country's pension system. A recent transport strike was the longest in French history. And though the controversial pensions bill moved to France's parliament earlier this week, labor unions have vowed to continue opposing it on the streets. So, where will this standoff end? And is there a broader battle at play over the nature of the French welfare state? Joining me to discuss this is Roland Lescure, a member of parliament for President Macron's ruling party. He joins me now from Paris. Uh, Roland, there was this wave of optimism when President Macron, this supposedly pragmatic centrist, came to office. We're more than halfway through his first term. There have been these major protests. Things aren't exactly going to plan, are they? 
Well, they are on their own. You know, as you mentioned, we are on the move and we are keep on moving. We've changed funds in lots of different ways for the last two and a half years on training, on education, on university, on the labor market, and now on pension. And yes, on every one of those reforms, you always find someone in France who's going to oppose them. But on the whole, I think we're beginning to have results. Unemployment hasn't been as low as it is today for the last 11, 12 years. There's job creations, there's company creations, foreign direct investment is coming into France again. So there are moves, there are results, and there are resistance. And that's what we're trying to process. Is, you say you have results and you're doing well on the economic front in terms of unemployment, etc. And yet President Macron's approval rating is more than halved from 66% after he was elected uh, to 30% last month. That's embarrassing, isn't it? Well, it's not embarrassing when you compare it with pre previous presidents that were, were well lower in, in the midterm. I mean, we had European elections last year. And before we had them, that was in June, people thought he's very unpopular, people don't like him. When you look at the results of those elections, unfortunately, Madame Le Pen was well ahead. We were very close to her. And behind that, there was no one to be seen. So at the end of the day, when and if we ask French people to vote and not just reply a poll, I'm not sure the results will be as bad as they seem to be on the polls. Um, many would argue that your pensions reform, which I think turns 42 different pensions into one quote-unquote streamlined universal pension. A lot of your critics would argue that that will leave a lot of people in France worse off. What do you say to them? It's true to say that amongst the 42 pension system you are talking about, some of them, bus drivers, train drivers and a few of these, are probably going to be not as well off as they are today. That has to be said. But for instance, in France, 20% of women they take their pension to make sure that it's a full pension age 67. After this pension, they'll be able to do it at 64. So it's, as always in France, people who are not very happy with the reform, we hear them very well. But people at the end of the day that are going to be happy with that reform, sorry, we haven't heard that much. It's not so, just pension yeah, reforms. Ahead. France has had a wave of protests in the past year or so. There were the yellow vests that the world watched protesting in, in Paris and other major cities. There were the doctors protesting, firefighters have protested. And then you have this heavy-handed French police response where, until recently, they were using tear gas uh, containing TNT. Uh, according to one report, 325 protesters have been injured in the head, 25 have lost an eye, and five have lost their hands. That's outrageous police brutality, isn't it? Well... For one, no one's happy with that situation. You know, I'd rather no person to be wounded and French people who've been doing it for decades, you know, to be able to demonstrate peacefully in the streets. But you have to understand that the nature of the demonstrations in France has changed dramatically. I was, you know, young in the 60s and 70s. I went demonstrating with my parents. It was a celebration. You, you know, go against the government, then you negotiate and you go home. In those demonstrations that you're alluding to, there's a lot of people that are actually attacking the very essence of democracy. They want to kind of turn the French state upside down. We've seen, you know, heads of our president on top of pikes being shown around in the streets. So I'm not saying that, you know, any police excessive violence shouldn't be condemned. And there's inquiries in those, in some of these incidents you were allowed to. What's your to, reaction and... when you hear that 25 people have lost an eye and five people have lost their hands. That's the kind of thing you might hear in some dictatorship, not in a modern Western democracy trying to deal with political protesters. Losing your hands? No, but a lot of policemen have been wounded too. I'm not happy with that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I wish it wasn't the case. But I'm not allowed anyone to say that France is in any way close to any dictatorship. This is a free country. You can say whatever you want. You can demonstrate as much as you want, and you can go and on yet, strike. And yet your government has been heavily criticised by Human Rights Watch, by Amnesty International, which has talked about excessive use of force by the police, has demanded French authorities exercise restraint. Again, these are leading international human rights groups uh, that are telling a Western democracy, you need to exercise restraint in how you deal with your protesters. Yeah, and, you know, I hope these people have also come and seen what's happening in those demonstrations. I did. You know, I took off my suit, my tie, and I went in those demonstrations. And I can tell you, some of those people, and again, 
I'm not happy that few of them have lost an eye or a hand, but those people are it's insurrection. You know, they're, 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 they're violent. They're there to actually kick the police. And that's not what a peaceful, democratic demonstration should be about. When you say this is an insurrection, come on, this is France. Protesting in France is as French as anything else you can think of. As you said, you yourself went to protests, and let's be clear, there were violent protests in France in the 60s and 70s too. This idea that protests are somehow insurrectionary is a very odd claim to make from a French politician. No, it has changed dramatically. I can tell you, I've been in those. Some of these people, and I'm not talking about a lot of people, probably a few hundreds, but those people, I mean, they're wearing in their backpack, you know, weapons to actually go and kick the police. It's a very different way of demonstration that we had in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and the noughties. This is very recent. It's about five years old. People are not afraid of going to demonstrate. And I can tell you, it's not about Maybe they're violence. afraid of it's losing their hands. The people in those demonstrations that are there to actually make some, not just noise, but sound and furry and blood. That's completely unacceptable. So again, you know, the police is doing their job, and some of those acts of the police have probably gone too far, and this should be condemned. But we shouldn't turn the table. You know, the people who are starting that violence are the ones in the streets, Let me, not the ones that okay. are trying to protect the French people. Let me ask you this. President Macron is a former investment banker who, uh, who many see as a man trying to privatize or neoliberalize the French economy. Has this now become a battle for the soul of France, or at least the soul of the French economy? Is this now capitalism versus socialism in France? Well, I think that Emmanuel Macron is probably trying to put those two together. To, get, to keep the brighter side of capitalism, which is free enterprise, technology, innovation, wealth creation, while preserving that part of the French model that always has been more equalitarian, more redistributive than other models, including in Washington, where you sit. We've actually made, I say, a lot of casualties in the French political class, and those guys are trying to get back by characterizing us a bit, a bit like, as you said, you know, we are the Thatchers of the 21st century. We're not like that. In that pension reform, there's a lot of redistribution. We want to, for people in the suburbs, we want for people in the territories that haven't benefited from globalization to be put back in the system through education, through on-the-job training. We've never created in, you know, as many companies as we are now in France. We haven't attracted so much capital. In the meantime, we're keeping that redistributive model that France is okay. known for. So you're saying you're keeping the model you're known for. You're saying that Macron is not a Thatcher figure. But when you have the president comparing himself to the Roman god Jupiter, referring to demonstrators as, quote, slackers, cynics and extremists, and suggesting that they go get jobs instead of protesting, surely you can understand why his image has taken such a beating and why he does seem to be so anti-working class right now to many people. Yeah, well, I don't think he's anti-working class. He's anti, um, you know, insurrection. That's one part of what you said. On the working class part of the story, on the, you know, let's go and cross the street and, and, and find a job, he has recognized himself that those words were probably out of place. He's actually changed his tone. He's trying to, again, calm everybody down, pacify the country, and make sure everybody understands that no one not himself, not myself, not anyone in this government, is waking up in the morning thinking, how can I make the rich richer? It's all about changing the French model in order to preserve it, to make sure that the people, the outsiders of the French model, that have been excluded from education, jobs, pension, for the last 40 years, are now put back in the game. And it's a fundamental change. It's not making people happy. Mostly minorities. And just to be clear, you're a member of his party. Do you believe the president could be compared to the Roman god Jupiter? <laughs> I certainly don't. Yeah, he, he probably had a bit of a, say, what, poetic hearsay that day. But on the whole, he's very pragmatic, very human, very hardworking. Roland, one last question before I let you go. Given France's electoral system, which has these two rounds of voting, multiple candidates, uh, Macron was not the first choice. Uh, for the majority of French voters. Even those who voted for him in the second round when he won a majority did so in opposition to the only other option on the ballot paper, Marine Le Pen, uh, leader of the then National Front, now National Rally. You would recognize, surely, that you benefit from the fact that the only real alternative to you guys right now is the far right. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm sorry for that. 
I wish we had other oppositions, but the other oppositions are dead, or nearly so. So if they can get up, get their acts together, you know, whatever, be born again or find another way of opposing, I'd be very happy. I'd be much happier to be, you know, having a debate with democratic forces that are not racist, that are not protectionist, that are not looking back in the mirror to see if France was better 100 years ago. That's not what I have. I don't choose my opposition. I deal with the opposition I have, and unfortunately, it's Madame Le Pen. We're trying to make everything that she doesn't get into power to make sure that France is a better place, France is a more pacified place, France is a more unique and united place. I'm working on it day and night, and Emmanuel Macron, Jupiter or not, is doing it as well. Roland Lescure, thanks so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you, Mehdi. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.